Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, yeah, so as was said, I'm Andrew Bacon. I'm the co-founder of Spaceforge, along with my other founder, Josh Weston, uh, who's the CEO. So, uh, I guess I'm going to go straight into the straight into the presentation. So, we're talking about a couple of things. I'm going to be talking about reusability of spacecraft, how reusable spacecraft can be used to help the climate, and also how they can be used to uh, mitigate space debris as well, and actually how space debris and uh, climate change are, are slowly starting to become uh, one and the same issue. So if I go straight into it, so what is Spaceforge? So a relatively new company, uh, we founded in 2018, um, and we have one goal, which is to develop in-space manufacturing, uh, and not just in-space manufacturing for space, so we're not about making larger antennas in orbit, we're about making materials that you can only make in space, and then bringing them back down to the Earth. Uh, and particularly, we are focused on those kind of products that would help people and humanity and the Earth uh, itself. So, but to be able to, to to enable the bringing back these materials, you have to build a lower cost uh, and more reliable way of returning a satellite back to the Earth. So, why do you want to manufacture in space? Well, we always like to say uh, manufacturing on Earth is actually one of the worst places you'd ever want to make anything. A um, couple of reasons. One is gravity. So, okay, we know gravity is very useful to us. It holds the atmosphere down and holds us down. But when you're trying to mix two materials together, so if you say want to melt, I don't know, lead and aluminium together to make a lead aluminium alloy, you mix those two materials together and on Earth. And what happens is gravity will bring the lead down to the bottom. Um, so you end up with a very differentiated alloy. So not very good. So you have to do lots of things to overcome that. Um, Atmosphere as well. So obviously we're big fans of the atmosphere around here. Oxygen's great. But the problem is um, oxygen is when you raise the temperature materials like in a furnace up above, say, five, six hundred degrees centigrade, the oxygen in the atmosphere tends to um, get involved, liberate and reduce and oxidize that material. Big problem for metals and that makes them brittle. Um, and also when you're trying to do biological or other chemical processes or even semiconductor manufacturer, um, a, the smallest amount of contamination you're getting from dust and everything like that can ruin products. And then temperature as well. I mean, on Earth, um, we don't really have that big a temperature range when you consider the possible temperatures. So we go to the coldest place on Earth, it's minus 50. Hottest place, it's plus 50 uh, degrees centigrade. Um, but that's not so useful. It's you know, to, in order to get to the, up to the temperature where you're melting metals and things like that, you know, the atmosphere and the Earth kind of tries to resist you from getting to, say, 1,000 degrees centigrade. It doesn't like it and will try and take your, the heat away. Now, what manufacturing in space does, it enables products that are, we can say with some confidence, some of them are impossible to create on Earth or near enough impossible as it makes no difference. So the weightlessness you get, or we say microgravity, um, certainly it, it overcomes that alloying problem I talked about before, where the lead and, and aluminium would mix perfectly. This is a big problem for um, semiconductors, fiber optics, um, other kinds of glasses and other types of crystals. So microgravity, we know, makes uh, crystals, crystalline structures grow better. Vacuum as well. I mean, if you go to 500 kilometers altitude, you've basically what got what's considered an ultra vacuum, something that would normally take multiple stage pumps to achieve on Earth. Um, in space, you just open the door and you're down at you know a trillionth of a normal atmospheric pressure. And near absolute zero as well. So if you get a spacecraft, shade it from the sun and just point it at cold space, you can get down to 10 Kelvin without needing any active cooling systems. Now, it is possible to do each one of these on the Earth. You can achieve weightlessness by having parabolic flight. You can achieve vacuum by multiple vacuum pumps. You can have near absolute zero cryogenics. But trying to put two of those together into the same experiment, or heaven forbid, three, is really difficult, and the cost goes up hugely. Um, space, they're all available there for free. So, but we like to point out, you know, in-space manufacturing is, is not new. It's been going on for a very long time, even from, you know, the first cups of coffee made in space by the Apollo astronauts. Um, but you can go back to sort of the 70s on Skylab. They were growing gallium arsenide crystals. Um, the Wake Shield facility launched off the space shuttle that was also doing um, uh, gallium arsenide film growth and things like that. And of course, you can't forget the International Space Station. You know, there's been huge amounts of activity going on there, uh, particularly in terms of 3D printing. And Viva, even now, organ uh, organ printing and um, pharmaceutical research has a long history of going on in the space station. So this is nothing new. Um, but what we're seeing now is we're kind of transitioning from a science phase, which the ISS has done a huge amount of work for, to actually start to think, oh, can we actually 
start to use these materials on Earth. So the main things, uh, certainly in the near term, we've identified that really helps with is one, semiconductors uh, in orbit manufacture, two composites and pharmaceuticals. Now, okay, the subject of this, this um, session is about climate change. So one of the things is if you look at our where energy is being used on Earth. Now, there's lots of things that are using energy. I mean, we could look at the heating in our homes and um, other things like that. But actually, a very, very large amount of our energy uses on Earth is driven by the efficiency of semiconductors, particularly power electronics. Um, there are many types of power electronics that are used in things like our communications our architecture, our electric cars, electric trains, um, our national grid that are actually not that efficient. Uh, and we're burning huge amounts of power. Um, and by making better semiconductors in space, we can really, uh, it's one of those knock-on effects that if you make the power converter 10% more efficient, then you not only have you saved that power, but you've also need a smaller cooling system. So then you're making the vehicle lighter. So this is a big issue if you're trying to make an electric aircraft, for example, uh, where every kilogram counts. So semiconductors really help bring down um, that CO2 generation and the energy needed for it. Um, composites as well. I mean, the one we'd like to say is, you know, we're not going to be printing a wind turbine in space, um, at least not for a little while. But there are certain things you can do with, say, creating new super alloys that would you could form into a bolt. So the, the issue with the efficiency of a wind turbine is basically how big the blades are. Um, and there's a limit. If you look at the limitation to how big a blade is, it's not determined by what we can build. It's usually determined by what we can fit on a road or on a ship. Um, so what you need is very high strength bolts to hold those blade pieces together. So the stronger the bolts you can make, the bigger the wind turbine blade and therefore the more efficient the wind turbine. So just by making tiny bolts in space out of new super alloys that you can't make on earth, you can make a more efficient wind turbine. And this is where we really see space making a big differentiator, making small things that can have a really big impact. And yeah, as Space Forge, we do plan to be the first net zero or carbon negative company, I should say, because the products we are making, we want to save more CO2 on Earth and that, than it costs to make them. And that includes the launch as well. We're looking at the launch. Um, there are some materials you can make that have a really big knock-on effect in terms of CO2 generation over their lifetime. Um, that's all great, but there are some really big barriers. So, I mean, the ISS is a fantastic place to do research, but it's a, it's a laboratory. It's a laboratory, not a factory. Um, and there are a lot of restrictions you can do because we have astronauts inside the space station. We tend to care about astronauts a lot. So there are a lot of processes and things like, you know, you can imagine my example earlier from melting lead aluminium alloy. That would never be allowed inside the space station. We're not going to be having lead vapor inside the pressurized environment. Uh, even if you go outside the space station, it's quite, it's still the space station leaks oxygen, slightly worryingly, but it is planned for. Um, but even then, you have an issue where if you're trying to make really high quality semiconductor or alloy materials, the residual auction around the ISS would pollute those. So, and it's not a dedicated platform as well. So there's lots of activities going on in the space station all the time. So it's very difficult to make sure that your production is getting um, uh, the, the attention that it needs. And also soft returns. So if you look at the current availability of return vehicles, like the Dragon, SpaceX Dragon, the the Soyuz, um, they are not comfortable rides home. I mean, it's particularly in the landing, there's a very large shock involved in the landing, but also there's shocks involved with the separation. So if you've gone to this effort of making these new pharmaceuticals or new uh, wafer materials, um, you know, you can break them in those last seconds of the journey. So what we're developing is called the Forge Star, initially the Forge Star 1, but the Forge Star series of satellites. And uh, unfortunately, for many various reasons, I can't show it here. <laughs> but uh, it will be revealed on what it actually looks like in the not too distant future. But it gives you the idea. It's a small satellite. Um, it's only about 25 kilograms uh, and it will only be making small sums of material, but it will, we will be bringing back the whole satellite, 100% of it that we launch, we will bring back. Um, and it's been designed in such a way that we'll be catching it in the net to be able to, to really smooth out that landing and make sure that those materials aren't getting broken on, on, on the last five meters or so of its journey. So yeah, I should say this mission is completely dedicated to the needs of in-orbit manufacture. So it's not designed for Earth observation. It's not designed for communication. It's just designed for getting power 
and providing that ultra vacuum um, low temperatures or very high temperatures as as are needed by customers. Now, space debris. I, I wanted to touch on space debris because um, it is a growing concern. Um, even you know, okay, we need to be careful about the whole space environment. Is it usable for everyone going forward? But also, as we've seen recently in reports published by the Aerospace Corporation, actually. Now we are really starting to launch thousands of satellites. Um, you know, when they are re-entered, they are dumping aluminium into the upper atmosphere, and that starts to become potentially an issue uh, and another factor that could could cause climate change. So now, uh, you know, space debris is a growing concern, and the problem is it's also an economic problem with space debris because who's going to pay for it? It's the same with climate change. You kind of have three options. You know, if you're an operator, you can dispose of your satellite which, okay, doesn't really have much short-term advantages to an operator because they're getting rid of their satellite, they can't use it anymore, and they may have the environmental concerns. You could recycle satellites. I mean, that is definitely something that could happen in the future. We could have a space station, grapple, rip apart satellites, reform in these new ones, free printing. That is very much on the horizon, but it's not there yet, and it'll probably be a good 10 years. Or you can bring these satellites back. Now, it does, yeah, I'm talking about all satellites, communication, Earth observation, the whole lot. It does add complexity to the spacecraft, but you do have long-term advantages in that if you'll be able to get your satellite back, you can upgrade it, maintain it, um, recycle it, and you know, start to bring your costs down. Uh, just a point about return. I mean, there's loads of different types of return, um, but one, that, one of which is not often talked about, but this is from the Corona program, unfortunately named Corona program, but uh, where they were doing the bucket return. And just say that uh, like being able to catch things in a net or in a hoop before they land. This is a very well-established technology. So economics of, of return, basically, or well, the space industry. Launch as a price is decreasing. We've seen this. I mean, 2018, it's really got down to about $1,400 per kilogram if you're using a Falcon Heavy. The availability of launch is definitely increasing. I mean, we're at sort of 500 tons in 2018. But what has not changed is the design, build, and test of a satellite. It really hasn't changed in terms of cost. And if you look at it, uh, I mean, forgive me if there's anyone in the crew, but um, the $800,000 per kilogram, that was for the Phoenix Mars lander, uh, for the just design, build, and test, doesn't include the launch cost. Uh, LEO operation mission, I used the one for Sentinel-2, $175,000 per kilogram. Even a small, a one U CubeSat, $50,000 per kilogram. So it starts to see where the actual cost in the space industry is. And why is this? I suspect many of this audience know, but to do a spacecraft, you have to do a large amount of analysis. You've got to watch out for your single point failures. The components are really expensive, Red Hub ones, and you're only buying a few of them. And you have to do very specialist environmental testing. So when you add all this, you're very, once you've launched, you're very limited in what you can change and fix back your satellite. So how does having a low cost return help? Well, <laughs> okay, do not take these numbers too seriously. They are highly interpreted, but I think it just gives an indicator. If you look at a car, you know, it weighs roughly a ton um, and it costs about $17 per driving hour if you include maintenance and fuel. So it's about two cents per hour per kilogram. A Cessna, a small aircraft is a bit close to about 26, so it's about 10 times more. And then kind of as you expect, because economies of scale, something like 737 is, a, is about point, uh, 14 cents per hour per kilogram. If you look at a spacecraft, though, if you look at the cheapest CubeSat, it's more like $2.85 per hour per kilogram. Sentinel-2, sorry, I don't want to keep picking on Sentinel-2. It's just a good example, and there's good numbers for it. $2.74 per hour per kilogram. And even the ISS is not, you know, and the, this thing, it doesn't seem to scale. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an economy of scale here. So it's, the ISS is still about $1.9 per hour per kilogram. So... What we're saying here, the difference is between a car, a Cessna, a 737, and a CubeSat, Central 2, and an ISS, is maintenance. It's the ability. If you try and design a car to operate for 10 years and you're never allowed to touch it again, it's going to cost a lot more. So that's kind of the emphasis we wanted to make here um, with what we're trying to do. Uh, a little bit of what we're doing at SpaceForge, I say, yeah, test as we document. So we're kind of, we're very much, um, I think the phrase is hardware rich in our testing. Um, we're building lots of things to test them. We're testing our shield, heat shield material. We're doing lots of drone testing of dropping our satellites um, from a few hundred meters. Uh, we also done some balloon tests and we're also developing our own landing prediction software. So just in my last 40 seconds or so, just want to say, you know, who are we? 
Um, so we're based in Cardiff in this office, which you can see behind me. Um, yeah, we've been so the last 18 months since we had proper funding, we've grown to 25 people and uh, I'm hoping to be 35 by the end of next year. So we're growing fast. We've just commissioned our new clean room here to build satellites. We should be able to build at least three satellites in one go there. We're very much focused on space worth manufacturing and we're looking to do our first launch, which was being funded by the European Space Agency in the next 18 months. So that is my presentation. Thank you for um, listening and I'll happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. Wow, that does sound exciting. You've got several prongs of challenges there, haven't you? Uh, technological and financial and uh, everything else that goes with it. But yeah, good luck. It sounds very exciting indeed. Um, a couple of questions. I'm sure there's going to be more coming in because uh, it, it is properly space age. Um, is it possible to scale up your production? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's uh, okay. That's a, it's a very good question. So I uh, mentioned the four star one is about 25 kilograms that's not going to be producing a lot of material you know a few bolts um and the idea is you bring that back and you show um the academics and the customers on the ground and say this is what you could make now the question then becomes you know and this is what, uh, an ongoing problem with these kind of materials is you're making material that possibly you can't make on earth and so how much is that worth <laughs> and it's it's quite difficult to work out you know this thing that doesn't exist how much will you pay for it uh, but we certainly have talked to a lot of customers who could buy very large quantities of, of these new materials they say if you if it does have these properties we will buy a lot of it now in terms of scaling you know it's interesting it comes down to um do you have lots of small satellites or one big one we're very much in the in the thinking of having lots of small ones so you know maybe up to 100 kilograms or so and using small launch like that um, and there's some very good small launches coming online, which have much lower carbon and footprint as well, because they're using more ecological fuels. Um, so the answer is, uh, it's extremely scalable. You know, we'll, right now we're looking at initial missions, but then we're looking at dozens of missions in a few years. And then who knows, maybe whole space stations in the future, but I don't want people on them because people are messy and will mess with your interactions. So. And are you able to reuse um, existing robotics, et cetera, for um, doing the actual manufacture? on the site yeah so one of the things is because we're sending up the whole satellite and bringing back down the whole satellite that it's actually quite limited in what you need for robotics wise um and it kind of simplifies the whole thing we don't need to pass materials into say a return capsule so yeah but there are a lot of great off-the-shelf robotics solutions that we can use i mean at space Forge, we don't want to build anything that we can buy off the shelf so uh and i know there's a lot of good uh, robotics heritage in the uk and europe so yes we will be using that and are you collaborating with other sectors as well, such as healthcare? You mentioned pharmaceuticals, for example. Yeah, I, we, um, we're talking to a lot of different customers, is all I can say about that, the whole range of potential customers. Um, yeah, from, from sort of big household names to you know, research um, departments and universities and things who are just excited to say, oh, yeah, if we could make, you know, I've been trying to make this material for 20 years. Uh, if you can make it in this environment, you know, that would solve all my problems. So, um, yes, yeah, we're looking at all of them. Um, I mean, we did look at the whole printing organs and things like that, and that's great, but it's, it's a long road from a regulatory perspective in order to get to the point where people are going to be making organs in space and then implanting them in humans. It will happen, but it's going to be a bit of a, a way. And is anyone else trying to do the same as you? Not in Europe that we're aware of. <laughs> so there are a few companies in the U.S., um but uh yeah apparently yeah there doesn't seem to be much going on in europe on on the whole returnable for this um certainly not that i've seen yeah well this certainly sounds like another one where it'll be great if you can come back in a few years um, <laughs> and, and give us an update you know show us the pictures oh I mean, hopefully show the satellite so <laughs> bring it back yeah <laughs>